Well, hey guys, happy Friday. Sipping on my lime water, cause it's, you know, Friday, feeling good. So for Q&A Friday, this week and next week, I'm gonna try something a little different. I'm going to film it as a sit down video. That way it's focused on uh, you guys' questions and answers. It's based on some feedback you guys uh, have given me in your comments and I just kind of think it, it uh, is less disruptive. That and, you know, to be honest, Friday is not like the most enthralling day of the week as far as my day goes because I'm largely indoors and then Friday nights I kind of just like to decompose. So so I'm gonna try it out this week and next week. You guys see what you think, comment below. Additionally, I think it'll be helpful for some of you guys who aren't so into vlogs, who just want, um, you know, kind of a weekly uh, forum to have some of your skincare questions uh, addressed in sort of a sit down video. Uh, I think it'll be a format that'll be, uh, have better reach to a wider viewership. That and the fact that I'm getting a ton of questions from you guys and so it's really becoming difficult for me to remember them all as I'm going through my day so I kind of just need to sit down and, and read them to address them to make sure I'm not skipping too many of them. So I just have them all here on my phone right now. Okay and so like I literally just got a question from um, Marjorie H and she asked, do you think coffee drinking affects the skin? It's probably because I've always got my biggie cap. Not that I'm aware of that there's any studies on, on coffee and anti-aging in the skin. I, some studies suggest that coffee drinkers may have a lower risk of heart disease. They're kind of all over the board, but uh, there are associations that are, there are observed associations. The underlying uh, reason has not been proven or demonstrated. With regards to skin, there is a study that shows that an association with uh, decreased uh, skin cancer in people who drink coffee compared to those who don't. But again, it's an association, so it's hard to know, like, are people who drink coffee more likely to stay indoors and never <laughs> stay indoors away from windows? <laughs> or, you know, are people who drink coffee more likely to live in latitudes where there's less ultraviolet radiation exposure? All of these things kind of come into play um, before you can say that for sure. But in the meantime, I'm gonna sip up, sip up guys, cause it's the good stuff. Okay, and the next question comes from Clara Schumer who asked me to elaborate on dimethicone um, and, um, and silicones in, um, in clogging pores. Dimethicone is an ingredient in, in many, many, many moisturizers. As a moisturizing ingredient, it's an occlusive agent, so it serves to trap water on the skin, which is actually excellent. It's not, it's not an oil, and um, therefore it's a component in most oil-free moisturizers, including the Neutrogena oil-free moisturizer that I use every day. It in and of itself does not clog pores. However, when it's combined with uh, petrolatum or mineral oil, it, it can be very poor clogging. But as far as an ingredient in a moisturizer to combat the dryness and peeling with, with uh, a lot of acne treatments, it's actually quite great because it seals the water onto the skin. Where it becomes problematic, I find, is in a lot of the uh, facial primers. And I think it has to do with the fact that a lot of these makeups Oh, here comes another question. A lot of these makeups has a lot of botanical oils in it, which when trapped on the skin surface underneath the, the dimethicone, I think could be very acne uh, promoting and pore clogging. So that's kind of what I was uh, speaking to. But yeah, it's in the Differin moisturizer. It's in the Neutrogena oil-free moisturizer. These are all great moisturizers for acne prone skin. So not necessarily an ingredient to avoid. Okay, so the next question comes from MC Pay. Um, hi, and can you do a quick explanation of cherry angiomas and anything to get rid of them? There are benign proliferation or growth of just little blood vessels within the skin. Um, they're incredibly common. Um, I don't know if you can see here. See, I've got one on, this is the, the dorsum of my hand um, here. It's this little red spot, and I've got a few of them on my stomach and, you know, other places. and. Um, with each passing year, I, I tend to find more of them. There is no uh, medically, there's no medical reason to treat them. The only reason to treat them is if they bother you cosmetically, in which case uh, there are a variety of uh, cosmetic procedures not generally covered by insurance uh, that could could uh, treat them. They're usually things um, like light, uh, 
like light electro surgery with a little um, electrical tool or uh, le uh, a laser therapy that targets blood vessels. But bear in mind that you may get more of them. So kind of is where, where you want to spend your money and how much it bothers you, honestly. Okay, and the next question comes from Leah F497. This is in response to the eczema video. Where I've mentioned this before, you only need to really use soap on your face, armpits, groin, or visibly soiled areas. Um, but she says that if you do use soap in, in the areas, um, do you just let it rinse off? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No need to scrub it off or anything like that. Um, uh, just let it rinse off with uh, gentle water. A follow-up question about uh, that I get a fair amount about is this dry brushing the skin and do I think it's necessary or useful? And the answer is no. I can think of nothing worse than scrubbing your skin with a brush. I mean, like, that sounds like something a monk would do, um, you know, in a temple somewhere to... Uh, to self-flagellate. Uh, you really don't need to do that. Derek Wang asks, one question regarding facial cleansing. I think this came in response to my um, skincare routine video. I see you cleanse your face twice every day, once in the morning and once at night. I hear from dermatologists that some people only need to wash the face w with water. Um, I wonder on the days with no makeup, is it still essential to wash face with cleanser and is twice required? No, you don't need to wash your face twice a day. And if you're not wearing any makeup um, or sunscreen, then you don't need to use any soap to remove anything. Um, just a little water is, is more than fine. Um, but when I wash my face in the morning, I'm using benzoyl, per a benzoyl peroxide wash. So I'm using it for specifically for treating my acne, not for cleansing the skin necessarily. I'm using it for the benzoyl peroxide. I find that in the wash form, it's very easy to tolerate versus a gel in the morning um, for me. Remove, I would otherwise just probably wet my face with water. I mean, you don't really need to wash your face necessarily in the morning. Everyone's kind of different, honestly. All right, Kelly White asks, what are your thoughts on parabens? I have avoided them in my skincare products for a while now. I picked up the different and noticed that it has methyl paraben in it. Okay, so parabens are preservative. They are perfectly safe when applied on intact skin. However, people, particularly people with eczema or people with rashy type eczema skin have a tendency to develop allergies to things that come in contact with the skin. Now that can include things like parabens, it can include dyes, it can include ingredients in makeups, it can include all natural ingredients. I think I mentioned this earlier this week that lanolin is an all natural ingredient derived from sheep's fleece that people with eczema can become sensitized to and subsequently develop an allergy to whenever it's applied to the skin and that worsens their eczema. The next question comes from Sarah Starr. I have been using Proactive Plus Facial Cleanser. It has these tiny microbeads in it. Is that okay to use? I've heard that acne prone people shouldn't use exfoliation on the face, but it's fairly gentle. What do you think? Okay, so yeah, in general, you should not go scrubbing the face. And I honestly um, avoid all of those, those scrubs on the face in particular. Anything like the St. Ives thing, uh, with the walnuts ground up in it or whatever. I mean, um, all of that can worsen acne uh, by by basically making little tiny micro tears in the skin. Next question comes from the Ned Love. <laughs> I was wondering what you thought of the L-lysine supplements that are said to ha help acne and the skin in general. There have been no studies looking at L-lysine for acne. And that, that also, I would caution you, the, these supplements are not regulated by the FDA. And so the, the probability that you're actually getting the L-lysine in the supplement is quite low. So it's essentially a waste of money. And as a follow-up to that, I also got another question about taking the collagen supplements or a ceramide supplement. And, and the same would hold true. There's really not much uh, conclusive or well-controlled, uh, there's really no conclusive or well-controlled uh, data for doing that for skin. The next question comes from Sophie Faye. She asks, can you please um, give some discussion to skincare after stopping birth control? Yes, if you have hormonal acne, it can flare the acne. 
So prior to stopping, check in with, with your doctor or dermatologist and, and come up with a plan, like a, a plan. Big drug going by. The other thing though that I think is helpful to know about starting and stopping birth control that can happen, our hairs are all in kind of a different phase of growing. It's normal to lose 100 hairs a day. Um, that cycle is governed by things like, like estrogens and progesterones that are in birth control. Um, it's not uncommon after starting and or stopping a birth control pill to experience several months later something called a telogen effluvium where essentially many of the hairs um, kind of uh, shift to the, the the shedding stage. You experience a lot of shedding of hair. Just know that's not permanent hair loss. All right, and so the next question is from Colleen Adams. She asks, um, since we're heading into summer, can you address sunscreen and bug spray being worn together? And do they lose their efficacy? So this is an excellent question. DEET, is, DEET has a long-standing track record of, of efficacy as a mosquito repellent. You should not apply sun, the sunscreen and the DEET together on the skin. You should not mix sunscreen and DEET together on the skin. The fact that products exist that have both of these in it is just ridiculous. And the reason is this, is that you need to be reapplying sunscreen every two hours while you're outdoors. You don't need to be applying DEET to your skin that often. So that's reason number one. The other reason is that it has been shown that the DEET can inactivate the sunscreen ingredients um, and make them not effective. So you're compromising the efficacy of the sunscreen in that regard. Um, but just some general, um, and it's okay to apply it to skin directly, but like I said, you don't want to apply it to skin in combination with your sunscreen. So what do you do? Well, you can apply it to your clothing, and that's actually probably better. Make sure you apply it to the surface of the clothing and not underneath. The way the DEET works as a repellent is by virtue of keeping a, a little bit of a vapor of, of the uh, repellent just above the skin. And that can be affected by how much you're sweating and the humidity in the environment that you are. So bear that in mind. The other tip is don't put mosquito repellent on your hands um, or your children's hands because then it increases the chances that you'll accidentally get it near your mouth and potentially ingest it or rub it in your eye. So that's something to avoid. Make sure you wash it off with soap and water. This is the time to use soap, actually, um, is uh, after you've been outdoors with uh, bug spray on. Never, pu never put it on underneath the clothing. Always put it on exposed skin or to the surface of your clothing is best. And don't mix it with uh, your sunscreens because it can um, render them ineffective. And uh, you need to reapply your sunscreen every two hours, but you really don't need to be reapplying the DEET that often. The next question comes from Stephanie Romano and she asks, any thoughts on Revitalash serum? Okay, so <laughs> I don't think Revitalash is worth it, honestly. Um, it's got a bunch of stuff in it that has no, um, that has no data to show efficacy in promoting lash growth. It does have one ingredient in it that I suspect is what, what may be making it helpful. That is a, a sort of a natural prostaglandin analog. Um, and that is how Latisse works. But here's the thing, Revitalash is like really expensive. And Latisse, uh, while you do need a prescription for it, um, it's cheaper. So I don't know, I would go with the Latisse because it's, uh, it's got actual data to show off efficacy and it's regulated by the FDA. So you know that you're getting the, 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 ac you know you're getting the active ingredient. And then the Pinky033 asks uh, about powdered sunscreens. Powdered sunscreens, um, unfortunately, are not as good as, as sunscreens green and a cream because they don't distribute the um, the they don't they don't distribute the active ingredient evenly enough on the surface of the skin uh, to be very reliable so likewise with the sprays um, they're less reliable than the creams so that's going to conclude the Q&A today guys I hope you enjoyed it comment below on your thoughts about doing it um, in a sit down format versus a vlog and um, I'll do it this way next week as well. So give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.